morning today we look at critical appraisal of a qualitative study uh, so we are all aware of uh, quantitative research however we seldom do a qualitative research so i thought we'll highlight few basic differences between the two uh, the first first thing is the common pur uh, purpose we are all aware that uh, the quantitative research is to test hypothesis specific research question however we discover new ideas during the process of a qualitative one the qualitative one is an observe and interpret while quantitative one is a measure and test approach qualitative one have unstructured or semi structured free forms that are used for the case report forms however the quantitative research have structured response categories the qualitative one is the researcher is intimately involved and the results are quite subjective as opposed to the quantitative where the research is uninvolved and the results are more objective uh, the sample size calculation is not done generally there are small samples in natural setting the quantitative one you have to predetermine your sample size produce fairly generalizable results that are applied to other situations so i just thought i'll elaborate on the left side of it all we've looked at the differences now i want to also look at the advantages and disadvantages of each of those features on the left side uh, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of smaller sample size one thing is that you are able to obtain more in depth exploration of people's ideas perceptions and beliefs in a qualitative research and you will in the process you will also discover new ideas the disadvantage is that it it cannot be it can be generalized to a certain population in in con in, in context essentially um in the natural setting the advantages are the results are more valid but it, but however the data may not be valid if observer becomes less objective if uh, because the researcher is so keenly involved in taking the interview he may put his own uh, per perception as the patients so they may also be unfocused if not properly planned the study may produce no information at the end of a long conversation the very question is it gives different directions to the researchers get more elaborate deeper in exploration during the data collection process however it takes is time consuming and may add on follow up questions at the end of it uh, so so this is the clinical scenario we're going to look at our hospital audit finds that emergency physicians clinical appraisal skills were inadequate and the hospital plans to conduct regular workshops on critical appraisal skills Dr X has been tasked by the HOD to identify barriers to learning critical appraisal skills. He is also charged with understanding physicians motivations for participating in these workshops. So Dr X had gone through the literature and this is what we found. So this is the article which was published in the BMC Medical Education in April 2022 Emergency Physicians Perceptions of Critical Appraisal Skills a qualitative study. Uh, so for for this, I am uh, going to use use the CASP checklist. They have ten questions uh, because there is a little bit of degree of overlap between the questions. I kind of clump them together. So this is in three sections. Like we see, are the results of the review valid? What are the results, and will they help us locally? Uh, so they have two questions, three questions. The first one is: Was there a clear statement of the aims of the research? What was the goal of the research? So they had looked at what are the emergency physicians' expectations and their prior knowledge of critical appraisal skills. What are the facilitators and barriers to appraisal skills for different stage learners? What motivates them to learn and maintain critical appraisal skills? Uh, why was it thought important? Uh, the the accreditation council requires that all of them need to learn how to appraise literature and apply it in their practice. Uh, in its relevance was that the earlier studies had shown that the, uh, there was only limited time given in the curriculum and inadequate training. There were all the causes as to why they were why the literacy skills were not adequate. Uh, is the qualitative methodology appropriate? If the research seeks to interpret or eliminate the action, the subjective experience of research participants uh, is qualitative research the right methodology for addressing the research goal. Uh, so uh, here they had uh, they had decided to answer the specific questions to in depth interviews and qualitative analysis techniques such as thematic analysis we will go through each of these uh, terms in the subsequent slides they directly collected data from the participants and analyzed the responses they had incorporated certain theoretical frameworks uh, although not explicitly mentioned 
but qualitative analysis may be the most uh, likely way, most uh, uh, way, uh, likely way to do this. Uh, so I think we'll just look at there are in qualitative research method there are multiple types. The study had chosen a one-on-one -on -one interview. This is kind of self-explanatory. One interviewer, uh, one interviewer interviews one participant. Uh, the advantages is that you can have in-depth conversations with them, you can get more ideas with them, while it is also time consuming. Uh, focus group discussions where there is one interview and multiple participants. The disadvantage is that uh, one person's uh, perceptions may be uh, clouded by another person's perception. Uh, there will be some people who may not be willing to talk like an extrovert versus an introvert. And uh, or the way the, the discussion moves on is based on how well the interview is able to carry forward the conversation involving all of them so that we can get the uh, sense the entire crowd. Uh, the next thing is uh, ethnographic research where you study people in their own natural environment in depth observation. Uh, I, I maybe something like an anthropological study would come under that. A case study research is when you want to this, let's say we want to describe an organization or an entity sort of thing. Record keeping is when you already have an existing reliable documents and you, uh, and you extract data from that. Uh, qualitative observation is data collected through systematic subjective methodologies. Uh, so is it worth continuing? Yes. Um, so was the research design appropriate to address the aims of the research? If the researcher has justified the research design, have they discussed how they decided which method to use? Although it, it was not explicitly mentioned in the article, but since the aim was to understand people's perspectives, barriers, and motivations, a qualitative skill is most highly like to discuss. However, they could have mentioned the reason as to why they chose one-on-one -on -one interview over other methods. Like they could have also included a focus group uh, discussion. They could have also had some sort of qualitative observations while like the interviewer could have chosen to observe the people while at work. So, but the fact that they had chosen only one to one interview. Uh, was the recruitment strategy appropriate to the aims of the research? If the researcher had explained how the participants were selected. So, purposive sampling was used to obtain 14 interviews. So, this is one concept again. So, purposive sampling is when selecting samples from the overall sample size based on the judgment of the survey takes on the research. So let's say now he is looking at uh, analyzing the uh, per perspective of an emergency physician. So we are going to pick somebody who is in the emergency physician, who has been in it all long enough, who is likely to talk. So essentially you are picking and choosing your participants. Uh, so participants were selected based on their knowledge and the potential to provide valuable insights and contribute meaningfully to the study. However, they had varied participants. They had residents, faculty, across ages and uh, both male and female. Uh, if there are any discussions around the recruitment, why some people chose not to take part? This um, so this study uh, was done in the New York, uh, was done in New York and the hospital had 48 emergency medicine residents at any given point, in addition to a lot more faculty which is not mentioned. Uh, how did they choose just these 40? Why did the others not want to take part was not explicitly mentioned here. So they could have mentioned how they selected each of these 14 people. So this is just to show, so they had like more males than females and this is the years post residency. So there are people doing residency and some of the uh, rest of them are all faculty depending on when they had finished their course. Yeah. If they explain why the participants were selected were the most appropriate to provide access to the type of knowledge sought by the study. Uh, so they had a targeted sample which is emergency physicians. They are in a tertiary care academic center. So they were interested in education and administration at an urban hospital. It's a diverse representation like we discussed, faculty members and residents. And they also had different expertise over the years, a mix of both seasoned attending physicians, like the oldest one had finished his studies 20 years ago, as opposed to somebody who has, who has been first, first year of training in ED. Was the data collected in a way that addressed the research issue? Uh, if the setting for data collection was justified, uh, they had done it in an urban academic hospital in New York. They had probably chosen this because it provided access to a pool of physicians who are actively engaged in teaching. Uh, if it is clear how data were collected, uh, so in depth, it was an in depth semi structured interview, either in person or via phone. 
Each of these interviews lasted for about 30 to 60 minutes. The interviews were recorded, de-identified in the sense that, um, so once it was recorded, so you will not be able to identify as to who it had, who the voice belongs to. It was transcribed verbatim using an outside transcription service. A constructionist approach to grounded theory was used, which I will tell you. Okay, so this is uh, so this is just a cartoon to show what a constructivist grounded theory is. Uh, essentially, uh, if I uh, essentially to basically collecting data, coding similar concepts together, form concepts into categories, generate a theory, and verify data. So if you have to look at this uh, picture, so you in the step one is to recruiting patients, then you prepare them for interviews. You interview them, you transcribe all the information that you have gotten, you code each of these. So, in, so like the participant one, as uh, let's say on this emergency physician thing, they say, uh, let's say it is boring. So, everybody who feels boring will be given the same code. So, each of the, as you go through the interview, there are different codes that are identified. All these coded ones are put together to form one theme at the end of it, and each of them are put under that. So you code and sort data, then you develop the grounded theory. It is essentially grounded in the conversation between the interviewer and the participant. Uh, if the researcher has made the methods explicit, so interview <coughs> guide development. Uh, so how did they use, so like uh, earlier I had said they had used a certain theoretical concepts. So the theoretical uh, concept that they had used is self-determination theory. Uh, which is basically an explanation for human intrinsic motivation for learning as to what will motivate us to go ahead in, in academics. So some of them, uh, some people feel that the human basic needs for autonomy, they become competent and they become relevant in the community. So that is what the self-determination theory looks at. So these are basically theoretical concepts of uh, learning techniques like like the kindergarten learning techniques and the adult learning techniques. The other one is a social cognitive theory where people are motivated due to the interactions which they have with the social environment. And the other thing is cognitive load theory. So that is kind of self-explanatory. Basically it's a way of understanding how the effort to perform a task can influence training learning. So if, if it's easier to perform, then they're more, then they're likely to take up the task. If it is difficult, they will not. So these are the three concepts that they use to form the question. So if they formed a structured approach to question formulation. So after that, it was reviewed by a panel of emergency physicians with background knowledge in education. Two emergency physicians who were not affiliated to this hospital were, uh, were conducting the interviews. They had received training prior to the interview. Uh, there was flexibility in the sense that interviews were allowed to add additional supporting questions or change the order of the questions. Uh, this flexibility is allowed so that more and more information could be gathered during the process of interview. Um, like I said, the interview process was a, uh, on the phone or in person and it took about 30 to 60 days. Coding and analysis, three individuals, which is two of these interviewers who are not affiliated to this hospital and the investigator who is a part of the hospital, all of them have coded the transcript separately and they had to meet periodically to come to a consensus on how to code them and how to uh, bring them up to teams. Uh, an analyst triangulation, triangulation method. So that is essentially uh, two or more independent experts. They review transcripts and make sure the findings are reliable and trustworthy. This is basically one of the ways to improve the credibility of the results. Uh, so this tri analyst triangulation involved so these are the theories that they had looked at. So this, at the end of it, this is the three, 13 questions that they come with, which is uh, how how will they how do residents define or the faculty define the appraisal? What was their understanding prior to this? Do they think this this exercise is useful or not? How were they taught while in their training? What are the main barriers? How do they think they should be taught subsequently? What motivates them? What promotes them? How do they perform? and such. Uh, so if the methods are modified during the study, if so, has the researcher explained how and why? Uh, so 
like just like any study, there could be a chance of modification during the uh, during the trial process. Uh, the paper doesn't explicitly mention if uh, if it was modified during the study. However, interview flexibility. So it seems to be a planned part of the method. So they have already decided that uh, they will allow flexibility. So it was not a mid-study modification. Next to review and feedback. The interview guide questions a review and revise based on the feedback from a panel. This suggests an iterative process in developing the guide, but it occurred prior to the start rather than modification. So from the paper, there was nothing very evident that had that it was modified from it. If the form of data is clear, so they had audio recordings and they had transcribed using an external source. If the researcher has discussed saturation of data, so this is another concept it does not mention in the article. However, it essentially means that uh, referring to the point at which no new information themes are observed in the data, indicating that enough data have been collecting to fully understand the phenomenon. Oh, sorry. Essentially, they have like 20 participants and about seven to number seven to number 19 have all been saying boring, 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 boring. Then we realize that oh, boring is one referring theme and we have, and if you're not adding any new data to it, then we can stop it. So that they have not explicitly discussed here. Has the relationship between researcher and participant been adequately considered? Uh, like discussed earlier, the, the researcher has a major role to play in the interpretation of the data and how, and how the study is conducted. So if the researcher clinically examines their own role, potential bias and influence during formulation of the questions, data collection, sample recruitment, choice of location. He did not mention, I mean it was not mentioned in the paper. However, the methodology describes the use of analyst triangulation to enhance credibility, so suggesting a level of awareness of potential bias and efforts to mitigate them during the analysis. Uh, how the researcher responded to events during the study and whether they considered the implications or any change. He did not discuss this. Have ethical issues been taken into consideration? If there are sufficient details of how the research was explained, participants for the reader to assess. So although it's not uh, explicitly mentioned, I thought the following points could actually point to that. One thing is that they had informed consent. One was obtained via email. And then again at the start of the interview, confidentiality. So once the interview was done, it was recorded, transcribed. The original recording was actually destroyed. So that they identified their identity is not there. And the transcripts were kept securely in one location. It is not accessible. Uh, member checking process. So member checking process is so it's after the end of the interview, the the summary that was made from the interview is given back to the participant so that the, the summary that we have got is in line with what he has said after the transcription. So summary report of key emerging themes was provided to the interviews for feedback as part of the synthesized member checking process. So they had a secure storage and destruction of recordings. There was no financial incentives to the participants. If approval has been sought from the ethics committee, so it mentioned that the project was determined to be exempt from the IRB and ethics committee, uh, which is a little uh, strange. I wasn't too sure. Uh, so, however, it mentions that all re all regulations and guidelines have been followed. Uh, so, what are the results? Uh, was the data analysis sufficiently rigorous? Uh, if there is an in-depth description, then analysis process. So, there was careful coding and memo writing. They had utilized to structure the data analysis process. The initial codes were created based on common keywords like we had discussed. So just, so if we could have started off a conversation, like a live conversation with the emergency department physicians, they would have gathered a few common words and that had been used to extrapolate questions um, based on common keywords and concepts find an initial set of interview transcripts. Uh, the they had create there was a creation of initial coding template. So the initial codes were used to so like they had initially coded like one to eight eight interviews. So they had come up with codes and subsequent ones were coded onto this. So initial codes were used to create an initial coding template, which were then used for the remaining transcript. So there was revision, the codes were discussed again by the research team and revisions were done. They had used a software called Deduce software to feed into all this so that each of these recurring codes can be put and themes can be made out of it. And there was a member checking process like I had discussed. If thematic analysis is used, if so, is it clear how categories and themes were derived from the data? 
uh, whether the researcher explains how the data presented was selected from original sample. Uh, it was not explicitly mentioned how a theme analysis was used uh, by identifying patterns, similarities and differences in the coded data to generate an overarching theme and categories. And they were mentioned in terms of themes and categories that we will see in subsequent slides. If sufficient data was presented to support the findings, uh, so they had also include the included the excerpts from the interview with the direct quotes. So that you can compare it from what the direct quote to what was to what was interpreted from it. So the themes and the findings are discussed in detail with reference to the specific responses from the participants. This helps to establish the credibility of the findings and provides a link between the data collected and the conclusion drawn by the researchers. To what extent contradictory data was taken into account? It was not explicitly mentioned. Contradictory data is if there were 20 participants, then 5 of them would have said they were happy and 15 of them would have said they are unhappy. So they did not discuss what happened to the other 5. Uh, whether the researcher critically examined their own role, potential bias and influence during analysis and selection of data for presentation. Uh, this, this, like I discussed earlier, the role of, since the role of researcher is very important in a qualitative data, uh, so the, there is a concept called reflexivity or self-awareness. It is essentially uh, an aspect of maintaining rigor and transparency, whether the researcher has to continuously monitor himself so that his opinion is not, uh, is not uh, put on to other people and, it is not, and his personal opinion is not perceived as other people's. Uh, opinion. So it is an essential aspect to maintain rigor and transparency. They typically reflect on their own perspectives, experiences and potential bias throughout the research process. This helps ensure that their interpretation of the data are as objective as possible. Is there a clear statement of findings? If the findings are explicit, if there is adequate discussion of the evidence both for and against the researchers argument. So there were clear themes and themes were supported by the quotes. If the researcher had discussed the credibility of the findings, uh, multiple analysts, they had three analysts, two of them not associated with the hospital and one of them being the investigator. Analyst triangulation like we discussed, they had more than one anal uh, analyst who had, look at, who had looked at the transcribed data. Member checking process which basically the, data, uh, the information is given back to the participant to see if it correlates from the transcribed data. If the findings are discussed in relation to the original quest research question, yes. So I just tried to color code this thing. So, so if I so we, they had so at the end of the study, uh, with the fourteen interviews, they had come up with six major themes and maybe about ten to twelve coding things. So let's say uh, somebody has said, oh, such a right topic doesn't engage learners or essentially someone for somebody who is so young. So all of them, so that was one of the main things, so lack of interest. How do you generate a lack of interest? So one person is so busy, it's just hard to find the extra time to read such a journal article. So time limitation was another thing that was mentioned. Uh, the other thing is that uh, difficulty. So you would never want to do something that you feel that you are not good at. So the other thing is important, so although they had so many barriers, which is not having any interest, being busy, and finding it difficult to use. All of them in common had uh, agreed to the fact that critical appraisal skills are very important. Uh, for faculty, they felt that this was used as guiding practices. And residents, they felt it was important to improve patient care. So next thing is uh, motivation. Because we had in the beginning asked the question as to what motivates people to learn appraisal skills. Uh, so motivation can be of internal motivation and an external motivation. Internally is basically they want to keep updated with current medical literature. Externally is just one product is thrown at them and now you're forced to learn this. So actually one of them actually says that they did not have the intrinsic motivation until I graduated and had to teach residents. That's actually what intrinsically motivated me because I felt like I had to have good reasons for why I was practicing the way I was doing. Uh, the next, uh, the next outline theme was facilitating engagement, which is basically how do you engage people to take part into this? What can increase people taking part into it? So, like for most of us, we always, if it means that it translates into patient care or 
it's always I, for most people find it easier to work in the world as opposed to sitting in the bush and studying. So if you can kind of correlate the two of them, that should be important. So so some person said so I think if there's a way to link it back, this is what you can use on shift. This is what can impact your patients. This is how you can take this information and actually use it on a day-to-day -day basis would help a lot. So connecting patient care with critical appraisal skills would actually improve the number of people who would attend these classes, giving them research product and normalization. Normalization essentially making it part of your work, like every day while you work, appraise it. Uh, teaching of critical appraisal, uh, so they want, so it said that you have to sit down and learn critical appraisal separate from the conjoint depends on the MI. It should be a tool, it shouldn't be a topic itself. So most of them have expressed the fact that we should be taught, they should be taught basic concepts and less ambitious ones. Most of the current ongoing studies are so elaborate, so time consuming and difficult that it was actually drawing people away from it. So they would prefer basic concepts and less ambitious ones so they can be used as a tool to go about their day to day practice. The level of competency with critical appraisal is to, so that they would build on the basic that they were taught. The goal is that they should be able to read a paper and be able to interpret the results in a context that allows them to apply it directly to patient care. So these are kind of the, like what stood out the most and these are all coded and these are the themes from that. So at the end of it, they had figured out this cognitive flow theory that we had discussed would help with the time and difficulty, which is basically make it more, uh, more easier and the self-discipline theory would help with improving interest. Uh, how valuable is the research? If the researcher discusses the contribution the study makes to existing knowledge or understanding, do they consider the th findings in relation to correct practice or policy or relevant research-based literature? Uh, there was no definite mention of comparison with the previous existing knowledge except for the one line that they had presented is the initial introduction as that lack of time was Lack of time was the uh, was one of the factor that was deterring people from attending this. If they identify new areas, uh, there was need for further investigation, effective methods. Uh, right now, the study kind of ends with saying that these are the barriers that they they have found, and they, these could be the ways. But there was no def if there was no uh, definite model as to how we can come up uh, come across this. Exploring role of professional identity formation in motivating residents to engage with critical appraisal. If the researchers have discussed whether or how the findings can be transferred to other population or are considered other ways the research may be used. Uh, this study was done in an emergency department in a tertiary care hospital. Uh, would it be the same if it has to be done in a general medicine ward in a not so busy uh, not so busy secondary level sort of hospital. Maybe they would have said, oh, we have more time, we would want to give more importance to uh, academics. So they may have answered differently. Or if they have, let's say if it has to be studying between uh, somewhere in the community medicine background, so they may have felt otherwise. So this, I kind of like summarize the entire thing. Uh, more so for any of us who would be interested to take up doing a qualitative study. So firstly, you know, identify patient uh, physicians interested in your topic, uh, find the samples. Data collection is, you can like, I have described uh, certain forms of data. You, you can have like a uh, one-to-one, you can have focus, you can have ethnic groups. Interview duration, obtain informed consent, record interviews, transcribe them, de-identify the transcripts, analyze data using the grounded theory, develop interview-based questionnaire, have components of that, try and use an analysis triangulation and coders, and uh, report the analyzed data in, in terms of themes and patterns, present it in a summary check. Uh, for further reading, we can use this equator network, SRQR checklist, and the correct checklist. Uh, so what should Dr. X do next? Uh, I have, uh, the red ones are the barriers that they had identified. Given the fact that the most the barriers that they had identified was disinterest, time limitation, and perceived difficulty, you could formulate an interesting, short, easy to understand course in epidemiology on topics directly concerning patient care in a way that to be able to independently appraise trials, considering that professional identity goals of being a good educator or a
That's good, Mercy. Yeah. That was very really well done, Mercy. Tough topic, new topic to do. Questions from the house? Anybody has questions? Text and allows them to apply it directly to page. So, 
each theme you say should be backed up by data. So this now we have made these things. Now one of the how do you know it's a very well done study at the end of the day? I go back to Elbin and say, Elbin, I interviewed you. These are the data which I got. Does this reflect what you think? Oh yeah. And then they have validated, yes, this is exactly what I meant. Then you get the transcript, let us say, Namrata is an expert in social science. He's totally apart from this study. I give her the transcripts and I give her the theme and say, this is what I have developed. Would you think this is it? So it's a triangulation. Different people are saying, yes, this is done right. One of the other things which I mentioned is reflexivity. Suppose I'm doing a study of alcohol use among residents, and then I get some themes. I need to say what was my viewpoint. I'm the researcher. I think alcohol is a bad thing, it's evil. I must take it up front. This is the researcher's viewpoint. Because whatever people say, I may spin that whole result as yes, even the residents felt it's evil. They may say completely good, it's normal, it's socially acceptable. I can spin it. So reflexivity is very important for the researcher to state which was my reason going into the research. So that is another important part of this research, qualitative research. The last point I want to make is, if, why, did this, why was the study done? Possibly because they found that many emergency physician residents are not enjoying this one critical appraisal workshop. So they wanted to find why you're not enjoying it. So they have come to this. This must, I told you, mixed methods in the beginning. This must now lead to an intervention. They could have said, the biggest barrier was lack of interest, the dry topic, or time limitations. If they say time limitation, then you can say, okay, now we are going to do an intervention. We are going to give the residents one hour a week to, do criti to learn critical appraisal. We'll have some video modules online, and we'll do this. So we do a intervention, mean a quantitative, a randomized control study, or a before and after study. At the end of that intervention, we'll find suddenly that either the intervention worked, if the intervention worked, we'll say it was based on this theory of lack of time. The qualitative study gave us an idea that if you provide more time, maybe people will be more interested or the critical appraisal skill will work. At the end of that, you'll come, okay, a qualitative study gave us a hypothesis that time is the major problem. We increase time and the skill improved. On the other hand, after doing giving more time also, still it didn't improve, then we go back to the same thing. Either we go back to another qualitative study, say, we thought that this was the important thing. We can even ask the residents, you guys said time was the major thing. We gave you more time, still it didn't work. Uh, even if we have more time, you are so tired, we go and sleep in the next time. Oh, okay, then it's another thing. So this qualitative research and quantitative is a cycle. So you ask a question, you do a study, then you appraise and see whether what you didn't work. If it worked very good, you may want to improve it even further. But if it didn't work, you go back to a qualitative study to see, okay, why didn't it work? We thought it was going to work. There may be more theories in that. So qualitative research is part of research. It's often given a bad word, bad name, but it's not so good. And it's actually very good. So that last slide, that reading material. If any of you are interested in doing a qualitative research, you can look at this checklist. There are two, and this equated network is a place where free, free guidelines are given, methodologies, how to do studies. It's actually not how to do study, how to report a study. Once you have collected data, how to report it. The reporting guidelines. But actually, if you never planned it properly, you finally find that I can't report half the things because I didn't know I'm supposed to do all that. So most people use it to plan the study. So there are in-depth interview, focus groups, then ethnography, all that. So the SRQR checklist is meant for most of the studies. Correct checklist generally for in-depth interview and focus groups. So you can the web website advantage is you don't have to search for, for cohort study, a consort is given there. Uh, economic study, just checklist. So it's very useful for finding how to do studies in one particular place. You can collect all and keep it there. They give you a PDF version, a Word version, and then you can pick up any of these. So if you want to do quality of your study, this is the way to It's a good place to start. Uh, for using critical appraisal, that first slide, the CASP checklist. So we, are, we must acknowledge that this CAS checklist is from Oxford University, UK. But this book is here, User's Guide to Medical Literature, was done by McMaster University. They, for every single study, design how to do it. But it's a big fat book. So qualitative study, they give a big description of what is qualitative study. They take one article 
and then question by question, they will give detailed description of why they gave this answer, why they gave that answer. So if you want to learn how to do critical appraisal properly, there's a fantastic book to learn. Now there's a bit like the Robbins and Baby Robbins and Peter Robbins. This is the full version. There's a uh, user's guide, this is a small version. And now the library has got the fetal version also. Just 10, 10 questions. Now this is uh, updated, this is the third edition, which is I think about 10 years old. The same questions are being taken by the Oxford group and they have tried to make it, uh, you can see that, go to the next question. Next one. Like each question, was there a clear aim? Then they'll give you three sub-questions to answer on that. This may just say what is the aim and you may not know what am I supposed to say at the aim. This Questions in orange, which Mercy has put in orange, are called hint questions. Okay, I don't know how I'm supposed to answer this question. Read the hint. So the cast questionnaire can be, you can print up online also. There's an online document, you can print and read people. Or you can use it for presentation. So the cast checklist is a useful place for doing all sorts of critical appraisals. In the world over, people are using this cast. It's free, downloadable, and you should all use this for qualitative research. Mm. In this qualitative research, who was the researcher actually like, was he an emergency physician or a community physician or a emergency physician? So he so had his own points about what? Yeah, so that is also that important. So it's uh, uh, qualitative research have uh, different viewpoints. Some people say that the world is a fixed entity and there is only one truth and we must all interpret it as that what that is. There is one extreme of quantitative research is there is a mean and standard deviation by it. That is the mean and standard deviation. Everybody in the world has to follow that pattern. Up. Then there is a world view that there are some things which we can observe which is true and some things which are unobservable. So the world is made up of observable and unobservable truths. There is another world view that everything is Maya. Like whatever we observe, so uh, Mercy's viewpoint is different, your viewpoint can be different, each of them is true. My total world view today may be different from tomorrow. So there are different different ways of interpreting. So qualitative research, some people look at it and think this is all gas, you know, like, what is this nonsense? But it's just a different kinds of views of looking at research. Mm -hmm. Then we can say that research from my viewpoint and from you, ethic, emic, two viewpoints, whose viewpoint, from my viewpoint or your viewpoint. So qualitative research requires a little more in-depth learning and understanding. You can, if you can Google our website, Samart, it's A-M-A-A-R-T, Samart. This is the website which we have a partner in the CMC, uh, for who was previously, they were part of the India Clan network which we use apart. Uh, Samart.org, Samart Chennai, one more A, Samart. So this clinical epidemiology unit has been around for uh, let me show that someone. It's a peanut, no, no, no. Not this one. Samart uh, NGO. Samart, we put Samart NGO. I think. It's come. The uh, research works. Yeah. So this uh, like they have CEUs, I told there are CEUs in many medical colleges all over India. There will be a social scientist, there will be a health economist, there will be qualitative scientists, and then uh, epidemiologists are people who like research to be engaged. So that is together make a CEU. Now all the CEUs in India together are joint clinical epidemiology, called India Care, Indian Clinical Epidemiology Network, India Care. So one of the people who was an expert in this is the lady in the yellow sari. That is Dr. Shubha Kumar. So she was part of MMC. Uh, now she's retired from there. Now she's got her own NGO, which is called the Samar. And she and one more doctor in the picture, you'll see Dr. Rani Mohan Raj. So they have made an NGO which teaches only qualitative research. So they done a large number of studies all over India. Uh, that's them in the center there. That's Rani and Dr. Shubha. For example, family violence. All over India, there is domestic violence studies. Uh, those kind of studies nobody in India has done before. Uh, stigma. So they are very heavily onto stigma of HIV, stigma. 
stigma from uh, LGBTQ, all those kind of things, stigma. So there are many good researchers to contact if you want someone to do a research on a topic. They also run regular workshops. So th their workshops are a basic workshop and advanced workshop. So basic workshop is they teach you this are the principles of qualitative research. Then if you come for the advanced workshop, they give you some transcripts. And then you have to go back home and try to make themes and data analysis. And uh, then usually I, I was telling Marcel, they we give you a big chart board. Okay, you, when you read an interview, a printed interview, you cut out, okay, this theme, this, this, this says facilitator, this says barrier, this says happiness, this says sadness. Then the second interview, so that you have a big chart board with order quotations from different people. You say adult male says this, 30 year old housewife says this. So you just put it like that. So you have a visual board. These are my themes and these are the quotations. So the easiest to just simply have a big chart board and do it like that. You can use a software also. So you audio record what Elton says, you put it into the software. It will give you a translated, like a CC. You know? We see in YouTube videos, you put the CC button, you can read that. But here it's printed out. So you're reading a word document, what the person said. Oh, time is a big constraint. So you copy the trans that word, what they said, and on the right side you can add a theme, theme, time. Put it there. So I interview Akash, then I'll interview number of them. Oh, he said time. She said her wording would be different. So it's the same kind of theme for theme. Then I put on the time. So at the end of the first interview, I may have interviewed six teams. In the second interview, I just have to add on to that, or new themes can be added, I can add quotation as well. So we have a software in CU called NYO software. You can, any of you want to do qualitative research, you may pay, we have some charge on it because they bought it. You can use the software, it is very expensive. They have used a deducer software. There is a mini software, new disk, NYO. The advantage of this NYO and all now is they have a cloud. So you do the interview in below and you upload the interview on the net. So I do the coding here, then Elvin can do it there. Dr. Shubha can look in Chennai and say, okay, I don't agree or I disagree. And we can see how these kind of things work. So their software are useful to help you in that. They also offer services like, I can do the recording in Tamil. Translate it into English and give it to me in English. So they have it for some 15 Indian languages now with NYO software. So that's the other thing. Otherwise, if the interview was done in Tamil, I must find an expert who would transcribe it into English. Then the English person must back translate it into Tamil and see whether the original Tamil and the retranslated version mean the same. Because this is qualitative research. It's about meanings, deeper understanding. So sometimes I may translate it wrong. So we can't use Google Translate for this. So qualitative science is very important. It's coming up big in the world. We should also become very good at qualitative. The uh, last one is transferability. Now this was done in New York in a tertiary care center. Can we go to Abhilash and say now you start doing? So we have to we have to briefly answer the question. In fact, uh, CMC may be like a tertiary care center in the US. Our culture, work culture, our attitude, the way we structure ourselves. Maybe quite similar. So we can't say that oh New York, some half white fellows, half black fellows, no, this is not New York, no, no white, no black. So we can't transfer the data. We should have a deeper thinking about it. You think that residents all over the world are saying, everybody will say find things boring, people will say time constraint everywhere. So then we do not have to do one more qualitative research here before we change our practice. But the change must be documented. If we change it, after some time we do another interview to see whether what we change had an impact. Okay, let's give Mercy one more hand. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Amina. So, I think the question I asked like one was the paper I read, would they said that uh, when you write a paper, the rules in the conceptual framework, say we have started with the framework, then they say it's not valid. So, I wanted to update. Conceptual framework is very important right, for the people here. That is, you must say that where does it fit? So, you say that you want high quality care in the emergency. High quality care and emergency is linked to knowledge of the physician. High quality care is also linked to available facilities. High quality care is linked to nursing services, equipment. So knowledge of the physician is linked to this training and continuing education. 
Continuing education is linked to ability to critically appraise literature. So you make a big framework like that. Improvement of care is the overall thing. But in that, where does critical appraisal fit? And what you are trying to do? That is called a conceptual framework. Where in the whole story of care does critical appraisal fit in improving care? So actually what Pramya's question is very valid. You must do something called a conceptual framework. Often they might do a conceptual framework, but the journal won't allow them to put that into the publication for lack of space. So somewhere you'll find in the supplementary appendix conceptual framework. Some journals will say without a conceptual framework, we won't accept the paper. Well, but this journal has obviously not insisted on it. But they would have made a conceptual framework. Where does particular appraisal fit in? Whole story. That's excellent question. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank you.